Well, it is a pleasure to welcome you here to worship at the Abbey in Pauley's Island, South Carolina this morning. I hope that what we do is of some value to you, that you can find this to be a harbor of, of safety and refuge, a holy sanctuary. Wherever you're listening or watching this morning, may you find that to be God's church, a holy sanctuary sanctified by his Holy Spirit. And I, I pray that as we go through this service this morning and our time together this morning, you will come to find and know the peace of God in your life, that he will have a word for you. Now, I want to do something new this morning. I'd like to start with the word of God, the teaching of the word of God's scriptures, and then I'd like us to move into the worship of God through morning prayer and some music by Jeff Kimber. So let's begin with the word of God. It was the Greek philosopher Philo in 225 AD who identified seven great wonders of the ancient world, seven great mind-boggling achievements that stunned and astonished people and filled them with a sense of amazement and awe and astonishment. And so I began to ask the question, what if God had seven wonders of the spiritual world, seven life changing marvels that could fill us with astonishment and awe at who he is. And so each week in these seven weeks, we are isolating one particular aspect of the total picture of God, of who God is. So that when we're done, we can take all of the pieces and fit them together in one great mosaic to develop a true picture of the character and of the nature of God. And my prayer is that not only will we come to know about God, to know a lot about God, but we will come to know God. And in knowing God, we will come to love this God. Now, last week, we talked about our omniscient God, our all-knowing God. That our God knows everything about the universe, he knows everything about the world we live in, and he knows everything about you and me. He knows our fears, he knows our failures, and he knows our future. This week, I'd like us to take a look at the omnipresence of God. That our God is an everywhere present God. Jeremiah wrote in, in chapter 23, verse 24, these words. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? There's nowhere we can go that God can't see us without his nearness, without his presence. He fills all of the heaven, and all of the earth. Now, I want to start with a bad memory. It was back in 2001 that I was introduced to a man by the name of, if this name means anything to you, I was introduced to him by watching him on a football field, a, a man by the name of Tom Brady. In 2001, I was in Heinz Field watching the AFC championship game between the New England Patriots and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback of the New England Patriots. They were beating us in the first half, but close to halftime, Bledsoe went down with an injury. The teams went in for the halftime, they came back out, and we noticed that Drew Bledsoe was not there. And then in the next series of plays, this number 12, this uh, rookie, sixth round draft choice that nobody knew anything about by the name of Tom Brady was Brady was going to have to play the second half for the Patriots. And so me and my friends, we were all celebrating and cheering. We've got this one locked up. We'll beat this little rookie up. Well, Tom Brady went on to have a near perfect game. I remember one of my friends saying, he is throwing the ball everywhere. He is all over the field everywhere. And we lost. Well, 
Theologically, when we say that a person or someone is everywhere, that's a figure of speech. It's an analogy. It's a, a metaphor. We're not saying he is everywhere. It's just what it felt like at the moment. But here's the deal about this great spiritual wonder of the omnipresence of God. It is this. Our God is everywhere present. Theologians put it this way. Not only does God's presence fill all space and time, but he is not absent from any portion of space or time. That is, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere present. As Jeremiah said, he fills all heaven and all earth. As human beings, you and I, we can't be in two places at one time. But God can. He is everywhere present. Everywhere. And this morning, with this great truth of the spiritual world, I want to suggest three ways that the omnipresence of God, the nearness of God, the everywhereness of God can make a difference in your life and mine this very moment. The first of those is that when I am alone, he is my companion. David writes in Psalm 23, verse 4, these words, it's the great 23rd Psalm. He writes, even though I would walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. You are with me. What he is expressing is the omnipresence of God, the everywhere nearness of God. He is present in all of creation, and consequently, if he is present in all of creation, everywhere in heaven and on earth, he is also present in your life and in my life. We call this the nearness of God. Theologically, we make a distinction between the transcendence of God, the holy otherness of God, the holiness, the sovereignty, the majesty, what, that God exists over and above his creation. He is distant. He is far removed. He is transcendent. But we also say that, that he is imminent with us, that he is present with us are the transcendence and the imminence, the nearness of God with us. He's so near that we can have a relationship with him, that we were not created to live alone. That's why all of us have a big hole inside of us for relationship as we're going through this uh, social distancing and the missing of family and friends that we just simply cannot get together with, we understand that, that something's wrong. This isolation, this quarantine, this separation, it, it doesn't feel good. It, 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 it doesn't feel right. We long for each other. And the reason we long for each other is because God created us that way. I've been saying he's a relational God, and he created us for relationship with him and relationship with each other. And when relationships get broken, life doesn't work so well. Pascal said, all of us have this God-shaped vacuum inside of us that desires a relationship with him. When my two boys were growing up, I would make a habit of going into their bedroom every evening just before they were going to sleep and tuck them into bed. And then I would give them a word and a look and a touch. A word, a look, a touch. Because I know that kids need to know they're loved, that they're connected. I, I, I know that kids need to know that we're present with them. We, we would never leave them. And so I would give them a word of how much I cared for them and how much I loved them, and I wouldn't want them to waste one single moment of their lives ever wondering about that. And I would give them a look right into their eyes, stare and gaze deeply. And I would touch them to give them a sense 
a presence that I care for you. I want to comfort you. I want to assure you. I want to be here with you this very moment. See, we were created to thrive in relationship with each other. And we were, we were created to thrive in a relationship with God. We were created to thrive in a moment-by-moment -moment awareness of God's presence in our lives. A moment-by-moment -moment awareness of God's presence in our lives. And when we don't have that presence, life doesn't seem to work so well. Take that away. And all we have left are a set of lifeless rules and regulations. All we have left is a God who is distant and far removed from our lives. But the wonder, the great wonder, is the nearness of God, of the presence of God. When I am alone, he is my companion. And so wherever we are and whatever we're doing, he is there with us this very moment. This is not just a theological concept. It's not just a good idea. It's reality. It's true truth. I can trust him this very moment. When I am alone, he is my companion. Now let's look at the Second great aspect of the omnipresence of God. Not only is God our great companion in life, but, but secondly, when I'm confused, he is my counselor. He is my guide in life. Psalm 16, verse 7 says this, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me that our all-knowing, all-present God speaks to me and gives me counsel. Even at night when I am sleeping, he is there and speaking to me. He's speaking all of the time and giving me counsel. Have you ever been lost? I mean, really lost. Not which end of the airport parking lot that I put my car in, but I mean crazy, scary, lost can't find your way back home. I got lost in the, in the mountains of Colorado one time and had to sleep overnight on the, with the side of a tree. It was dark and it was cold. I could not, me and a friend of mine could not find our way out. We were scared to death. The older I get, the more I appreciate how confusing and complicated life can get. I used to think that the older you get, the easier, the more simplistic life gets. But that's not really true. Life is an amazing thing that can, that can change quickly. I learn over and over and over again how easy it is for me to be fooled or misled. How easy it is to lose my way and get lost. And how desperately I need a guide to lead me through the maze of options that face me every single day. In my previous church, we used to take summer camping trips to Colorado, take family trips, 125 people, to a dude ranch on the side of Mount Yale. And one of the things we did during that week is we went right white water rafting down the Arkansas River. And it was a, a great uh, afternoon. You get in these big uh, inner tube shaped boats and there's a guide that's sitting on a little platform in the middle with huge oars. And he begins to instruct you and tell you what to do about everything. And then off you go to shoot these rapids and these what they call toilet bowls where you get sucked down in, in the water. It's a really exhilarating time. And, and it was always scary for me because I never really learned to swim. You know, when you have swim classes at the YMCA or, or at school and they have the, the 
sinkers and the tadpoles and the guppies. The guppies are the, the best and the tadpoles. I was in the sinker class all of the time. So when I would get in, in these rafts, I, I would check out the guide. And I would want to know with that guide, who I'm going to put my life in his hands for the next three hours shooting the rapids of the Arkansas River, I would want to know, is this just a job for you? Or do you have the experience to know where we're headed and how to provide for me to arrive safely? Do you know every rock and every ripple in the Arkansas River that we're about to shoot? Are you strong enough to handle the current? I'm looking for a qualified guide, someone to go with me and lead and guide and direct me to get where I want to go safely. Well, you see, in this great wonder, our omnipresent God wants us to know that such a God exists in our lives. Such a guide exists in our lives. We have a God who says, you can take my hand and you can trust me. I have your best interest in mind. I understand your unique personality. I understand your unique temperament. I know how you're put together. I molded and shaped and hand fashioned you. I can chart a path for your life. I'm strong enough to handle the current that you will face in life. I know the way. I have been there before. My path is a good path. I can guide you so you won't get lost when you get confused. The nearness of God says that we have a guide who knows us and loves us and knows the way and how to get there and wants the very best for our lives. When I am confused, he is my counselor and my guide. And if that were not enough, not only that when I'm alone, he's my companion, and when I'm confused, he's my counselor and my guide. Finally, in this great wonder of God's um, omnipresence with us, when I am discouraged, he is my comforter. The Psalms are filled with David's writings of God being present and with him and comforting him. Psalm 34 verse 18 says this, Our Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He is close to us. When our hearts are broken and we're crushed in our spirit, our God is near. He is present. There is this protective aspect to the omnipresence of God. The wonder is that he guarantees every person that when the storms of life come crashing in, we will have a comforter who is near to us. That whatever we have to go through in this life, God will go through it. God will go through it with us. I can't predict the future, but I can predict who will go with me into the future. I can predict the one who will walk with me and be with me, near to me, no matter what brokenheartedness or what crushed spirit I have. When my youngest son was growing up, every summer we made it a tradition to go to the amusement park and and I love roller coasters, the old kind, the wooden kinds of roller coasters. And this park had a roller coaster called the Thunderbolt. I couldn't wait until my youngest son was tall enough to stand next to that little uh, image of a man, a cutout image where you had to be a certain height before you could get on the roller coaster. And, and, and I, said, I said to him, I said, now, 
Now let's go and get on the uh, on the adult uh, roller coaster. And I could tell he was he was walking, watching, and hearing all the noises, and people were screaming and yelling, and and I, and I could I, I could almost hear him thinking, why in the world would we ever want to spend good hard earned money to go get afraid? But but I wanted him to experience the exhilaration of the ride. So I finally talked him to getting on the roller coaster. And as we got in the line, I made sure that we got into that first car <laughs> so that we could see everything. I remember when we pulled out of the station and the first thing that happens is you start this long, long, long climb, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. We're getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. I could tell that, that this was the highest that he had ever been as he was looking down at the people that were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And you know what happens on that roller coaster. You hit the top of that. There's that moment of calm, and then you shoot down as fast as that thing will go, being pulled by the forces of gravity and hit that first turn, and it throws you around to your side. And from then on out, it's one crazy ride of twists and turns. I could see... As we were going along, along on that ride, his little hands were, were gripping the handle so tightly that his knuckles were white. I could see that he was really getting to be afraid. And then he, then he said to me, Daddy, um, can you make this stop? Because I'm afraid. And I, and I said, I can't make it stop. I can't. But I'm going to put my arm around you, and for the rest of the ride, as best as you can, as we're being thrown back and forth and up and down, I want you to look into my eyes. I will be here with you. I'm comforting him. And he did. We pulled back into the station and got out, and we went over to a little park bench, and I said, Well, how are you feeling? And he said, well, I was really afraid. More afraid than I, I, maybe I've ever been. I've never done anything like that before. I mean, it's, it's like life, you know. It's just all these twists and turns. And, and we didn't know when it was going to stop. But as long as I was looking into your eyes, I was okay. I could handle it. I knew I could get through it. It's that connection. It's that nearness. It's that closeness that when we're discouraged and being twisted and turned and thrown up and down and sideways, when the world's not going to stop for us, it's just going to keep moving on, that we can gaze into the eyes of Jesus and we can be comforted. And we can know that we can get through whatever it is that we have to get through in life. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the hymn says. Look full in his wonderful face, in his eyes, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his wonder and of his grace to you and me. Any, anyone here this morning going through some rough times? some twists and turns, saying, I, I, I'm sinking. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it. I wish I could just say stop, but I can't. I wonder how long this is going to go on and how long it's going to last. Anyone here like that? Well, we have a God who says, when you get discouraged and afraid like that, I am your comforter. I am with you. I am everywhere present with you. I've often thought, and I wouldn't want to try this, but I've often thought that I could lose a lot in this world. I could lose my car or my home or even members of my family. As difficult as that would be, as devastating as that would be. But this one thing I could not lose. I could not lose my relationship with Jesus Christ with the nearness of the presence of God 
If I lost that, I would lose all. I would lose the ability to deal with whatever else was happening in my life. I would lose the capacity to handle life. If I didn't have him to be with me and to love me and be my companion and my counselor and my guide and my comforter in life. It is this great wonder of the um, the presence of God, of the nearness of God in my life. And I pray that all of us can come to know that this morning, that our God, this great theological, spiritual wonder of the world, our God is an ever-present, near God. When I'm alone, he's my companion. When I'm confused, he's my counselor, my guide. When I'm discouraged and afraid, he is my comforter. He walks alongside me. He walks with me. He actually, Paul says, he dwells in me. That is the secret. It's simply Christ and his spirit in me. He rides with me to see me to the end. And I don't want anyone here this morning as we're worshiping together in your sanctuary, in your church, wherever you are, I don't want any one of us to leave our time together not knowing that great spiritual wonder of the presence and the nearness of God in our lives. So let's pray together and come before that great God who is present this very moment and pray to him. Father, I thank you for these great spiritual truths that you are omniscient, all-knowing. You know my fears, and you know my failures, and you know my future. And I, and I thank you for this great spiritual wonder of your omnipresence, that you're everywhere present in our world, our universe. You're in control, you're in charge, and you're everywhere present in my life. And when I'm alone, you're my companion. And when I'm discouraged and, and afraid, you are my counselor my comforter. And when I'm confused, you're my guide and you lead me along the way. I pray, Father, each person this morning, myself included, as we think on this great gift, this great wonder, that we, we will come to know your presence and your nearness in a way that we have never, ever known before. That we are on a great ride that gets closer and closer to you so that we don't just know about you, but we know you. And because we know you, we fall in love with you. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to tell you that next Sunday, we're going to look at the third great wonder of the spiritual world that our God is omnipotent, that he is all powerful. And I, I, I hope that not only will you join us, but you'll share that message with your friends and family members as we come to understand these seven great wonders of the spiritual world. G'day, I've been encouraged by Colossians 3.1 this week, and it's an encouraging truth to remember in singing and worship this morning. It says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's easy to lose sight of that, isn't it, when we're consumed with coronavirus concerns. And it's good to remember that God is not somewhere out there in all these things. He is with us, and His rule supersedes every other rule, and His word is absolutely trustworthy. So let's rejoice. The Lord is King, and the keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice.
rejoice again, I say, rejoice. The Lord our Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When He had purged our stains, He took His seat above. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up. Your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come, and take His servants up to their Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. We're going to continue worshiping this morning in the Book of Common Prayer on page 79. If you don't have it, don't worry, you'll see the words come up in front of you. This is our service of morning prayer. It makes provision for when the church is not receiving communion together. And, and we look forward to that time when we can come back together and, and receive communion and community around our Lord's table. But right now, this is a service, it's a very old service, that was used by the church for hundreds of years to be a time when we can come before God and worship Him. And, and in the wisdom of the writers of the prayer book, they begin by us describing our true position before a holy, transcendent God. And in that true position, we come to admit that we have broken our relationship with God, have not lived our lives according to His standards. That's sort of the bad news. But the good news is that our God is an all-loving God. And he knows us and our failures, and he wants to draw us to him. He wants us to begin with who we are, get that out of the way by saying, I am going to forgive you, and I am going to cleanse you. Propitiation, forgiveness, expiation, cleansing. I'm going to do that through this time as we come before him with our hearts in prayer. John writes in his epistle, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he writes these words. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, now that's important. He's, he's saying there, if we think we're all in control and we're doing great and we can, our science, our technology, our education, our government, we can solve all the problems of the world, including this virus, and that we have no need for God, then John is saying we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. It's not to say that technology and science and government, medicine, Education is not a good thing. It is. It's created by God. But ultimately, we're not in charge and we're not in control. God is. And so he says, if we say we have no sin, John writes, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, this is a big but here, but, but if we confess our sins, if we admit our true standing and position before God, God who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins, that's propitiation, forgives our sin, and cleanse us, that's the expiation, from all unrighteousness, from all brokenness in our lives, all failure for God. And so let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that you have sinned, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And so, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now let's turn to the Jubilate, the Psalm 100 that we've been reading each Sunday. I think this is such an appropriate psalm for where we find ourselves in this season of life in our world, our culture, and our, in our lives. Psalm 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with a song. Now, know this. The Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Isn't that wonderful? That's what we've been talking about with the omniscience, the all-knowingness of God and the omnipresence of God, the ever-present God, that we can come into his presence and his courts with praises and thanksgiving. We can enter into the gates of God, into his presence, and give thanks to him and call on his name, for he is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness does endure from age to age. Now, this morning, as we continue in worship, we're a creedal church, a confessional church, and, and in morning prayer uh, this morning, I would like us to say together the Apostles' Creed. This represents what the Apostles believed and wrote about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's join together in the Apostles' Creed. And this is in the first person. This is what I believe. It's the credo. I believe. Let's join together and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we move from the prayer of confession to the jubilate, expressing the omnipresence and the ever-knowingness of God, to the creed, which expresses, again, the character and the nature of who God is, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of the Trinity. Then we move to our Lord's prayer, the model prayer that he gave us to pray. And as we pray it, I want you to know in the sense of God's uh, all-knowingness and in the sense of God's ever-presence and nearness to us, that he promises us that this day, therefore, he will provide for us this day. Not tomorrow, just this day. He will provide what we need in his knowledge and in his presence, in his look, in his word, 
and his touch. So let's join together in our Lord's Prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now I'd like you to take a moment to bow your heads with me this morning and close your eyes. See yourself before our Lord Jesus Christ. See him standing and looking into your eyes as you we ride the roller coaster of life. Hear him say to you, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will comfort you. I will be with you. I am everywhere present in time and space and in your life. I will not let you be alone. I am with you. We thank you for that great wonder of the spiritual world, of the role of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, of the Father, the Creator, all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, of the Son, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Rescuer, of the Holy Spirit, our Guide, our Counselor, our Comforter. And I pray, Father, that for all of those that are listening and watching this very moment, that we will have this extra special spiritual sense and awareness of your presence, moment by moment in our lives. May this great truth not just be something we listen to on Sunday morning, but, but by Wednesday, we're in the middle of that roller coaster ride. We remember that you are with us. And so, Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us. As may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge and love of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us. Jeff's going to lead us in a song as we close our time this morning. And I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday as we talk about the seventh, one of the seven great wonders of the world, uh, spiritual world, that our God is an all-powerful, omnipotent God. I'll see you then. It's amazing to ponder that God, who knows every detail of the farthest extent of the universe, is not too busy to know the details of our lives. There is no way we can go where he is not. Nothing we think that he is not aware of. That's an amazing thought. But there's also something else to consider where Psalm uh, 7 9 brings those things out. The psalmist sang, O righteous God who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and, and make the righteous secure. In that statement, he shows that God's searching of minds and hearts exists right alongside his righteousness. And that's an alarming thought because I know my thoughts are naturally unrighteous. I have to constantly die to my old way of thinking. Where can I turn but to Christ for his forgiveness and grace? And how else can I respond but to worship this God who is omnipresent and omniscient and holy, holy, holy? Holy, holy, holy are 
are you, Lord? You're the only one worthy to be worshipped and adored. All the heavens declare your splendor and the power of your word. Holy, holy are you, Lord. Lord, you know my every weakness, every thought that fills my mind, every sin within this daily grind I face. So to know your awesome presence in a feeble life like mine Holy demonstrates the wonder of your grace Holy, holy, holy are you Lord You're the only one worthy to be worshipped and adored And the power of your word Holy, holy are you, Lord With a word you heal my hurts By cutting deep into my heart And you know my deepest needs Before I pray you send angels to protect me When I think I know my path And you chasten me When I think I'm okay I'd never know your love If I ignored the song you sent And I'd never know your cleansing power if I did not repent for you cannot demonstrate your power without your gentleness and you cannot demonstrate your love without your holiness holy are you Lord you're the only Worthy to be worshipped and adored All the heavens declare your splendor And the power of your word You are holy, holy are you, 